Good morning. We want to welcome you to Calvary Baptist Church here in Larkspur, California, and our morning worship service this Sunday. We invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. For the last couple of Sundays, we have been looking at the greatness of our salvation. And this section, we are coming to a close of uh, Peter's uh, first chapter here. Uh, we'll go on to some other things that he's going to write on, beginning verse 13. But uh, I wanted to return to verse 12 this morning. We did not have an opportunity to be able to finish the last part, and I really wanted to go back and look at something else. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, he says very clearly here, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and diligently searched. Uh, the prophets, as they wrote, they were also looking at those things they were writing, wanting to better understand them, because they... Uh, did not have the cross yet, and there was still much that they did not know. Uh, so they searched diligently, and they prophesied of the grace that should come on to you. He's talking about those he's writing to, which includes us. And so he's saying to us, this is the grace that would come to you. They wrote about that in the Old Testament. Uh, we have to search the scriptures like they did. Uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to the disciples, when he talked to others, he was quoting from the Old Testament, showing them that these truths were there, and they spoke of him. Uh, they spoke not only of his glory, but they spoke of his, uh, of his suffering. Uh, when we look at Isaiah 52 and 53, we see that so very, very clearly. He goes on and he says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, so the Holy Spirit was in them as they were writing, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And then we come to verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed, that is, unto those prophets, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things. In other words, he's saying there that they were not ministering these things just to themselves, but to us. So they were writing for us. And remember, the Bible says very clearly, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And the Bible says that it is given for our instruction. Uh, some uh, don't bother with the Old Testament. They don't bother reading it very often, or they skim over it. Uh, there is even uh, at least one denomination that I'm aware of that never preaches out of the Old Testament. They believe the Old Testament was for them and that uh, we're, we, it has nothing to say to us. Uh, we would lose a great deal if we did not read and study the Old Testament. And notice here he talks about the things. I want you to just kind of put that in your mind, the things. He then goes on and he says, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Which things the angels desired to look into. So the prophets wanted to understand these things, and so did the angels. And so as Peter closes this section of this first chapter um, by reporting the inquiry, uh, made by the Old Testament prophets as well as the angels of God. Uh, the prophets searched diligently to understand all of God's grace. And isn't it wonderful now that we're saved, uh, now we can look back at the cross and we see that grace even greater. We see it even clearer. Uh, and the angels also wanted to know all about what the Lord Jesus Christ had done for mankind. Well, let's have a word of prayer as we continue this morning in the Word of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that when we look back, that we see how you uh, gave by inspiration uh, through thy Holy Spirit to holy men of old who were led by thy Spirit to put down thy precious Word. And as we Search the scriptures, we find there 
over and over and over uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in so many uh, different places and uh, in types and in very open and, and uh, clear uh, messages and prophecies. Uh, and so, Lord, it's a real blessing. And as we uh, have now had the privilege of coming to know the Lord and to be able to look back to Christ on the cross uh, and these things become much more clear to us. I pray, Lord, that our salvation will never be something we take granted for, that we always are, are rejoicing in and wanting to know even more and more and more of our salvation, to understand it better as the prophets and as the angels desire to. Surely we who have experienced this wonderful salvation must have a greater desire to know more about it. Lord, I pray that thy Holy Spirit would give me unction, enable me to preach and teach your word. I pray, Lord, you'll help us to not only open our ears, but our hearts and to hear from you because it's you, Lord, who is speaking to us. Uh, I'm just your messenger uh, and, and, and frail and uh, not, uh, not able to do uh, what really needs to be done, but uh, I trust you to empower me and enable me and most of all, Lord, as thy Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts, you make it possible for all of us to better understand thy wonderful truths. Heavenly Father, I realize that there will most of the time be somebody unsaved who will hear uh, the word of God, this message. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that thy Holy Spirit will take the word of God and speak to their hearts. Uh, show them their need of coming to know Christ as their Savior. Show them their uh, need of salvation because of sin and that they need to be transformed by the grace of God. Uh, I pray, Heavenly Father, thy word will go forth and will not return to thee void, but will accomplish what you would have it to accomplish. And bless our hearts, Lord, as we rejoice in our Savior and our salvation. Uh, just encourage us in the things of God, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, notice here in the midst in verse 12, uh, Peter says, or at the beginning he says, unto whom it was revealed, that is the prophets, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things. Now, of course, uh, Peter is talking about the apostles and others who had been traveling through Asia Minor and had been bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, obviously, Paul had gone through many of those areas. We don't know how many of those uh, communities had he gone to. He doesn't list them all, but uh, he probably had gone through. Peter more than likely had, because we know at certain times people were like was Galatia and some of these other places. And there were others that are not mentioned who were also called, and they went. They weren't apostles, but they were preaching. They were bringing the word of God uh, to the areas and all the people there. And so he's saying, these who have come and brought this message to you, these things that they have shared with you. And uh, so the gospel that he had preached, the gospel he had taught to them, was the same gospel that they were hearing from these others. So what are these things uh, proclaimed by the preachers of the gospel? Well, they are the provisions God has made possible through Jesus Christ's sacrifice for every single individual who comes to know Christ as the Lord and Savior. God has these provisions for us. Uh, they appear to be, and this morning I'm just going to look at seven of them, uh, there's much more, I think, but we'll just look at seven uh, as we look at this this morning. The first provision is eternal salvation for all. Uh, you're here in 1 Peter, so just go over a few pages to uh, 1 John. 1 John, and when you get there, go to chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Some people preach and teach that Jesus Christ only died for the elect and no one else. Now, I believe he died for the elect, and I believe in the election, and I believe that we're chosen by God, but look at what he says here in verse 2 of chapter 2. 
He is the propitiation for our sins. That is, he satisfied all of God's needs when he died on the cross. He is our propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I do believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for everyone. His death is sufficient for all. That is, it's a sufficient for every single person, but it is only effective for those who accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, some people will take this and they'll say, oh, well, Jesus Christ died for everyone, and so everybody's going to be saved. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It does teach he died for all, but his death does not do us any good unless we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so no one is excluded, no one is kept back that cannot come to know the Lord. Uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He invites everybody to come. Uh, it is not the Lord's desire that any should perish, but all should come to salvation. And so as a result of the price paid by Christ, anyone who is willing to receive him by faith as their Lord and Savior, will be saved. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, the uh, writer of Hebrews says this, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the sufferings of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. That is for everyone. He tasted death for all. And so first of all, eternal salvation is available to everyone. Number two, eternal fellowship with the Lord may be enjoyed by all who believe. When we come to know Christ as our Savior, we are able to be in fellowship with God all the time. In fact, if we neglect that, we're neglecting one of the great gifts that God gives us. He doesn't just save us. He wants to be in fellowship with us. Um, when, when having uh, wandered away because of sin, uh, the repentant soul is brought near to the heart of God. Paul wrote this to the Ephesians. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. Before we were saved, we were separated from God. Our iniquity separated us from Him. We could not come into His presence. We couldn't come to Him in prayer. We couldn't come to Him in fellowship. We couldn't do all those things. Now that we're saved, the door is open. If you remember when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that the veil in the temple was slit from the top to the bottom. From the top, not from the bottom. No one walked in there and ripped it up. God reached down and tore the veil and opened the way to the Holy of Holies so that all of us can come into the very presence of God. And we can do that all the time. What a glorious thing to imagine that. Uh, I think of um, especially people who live in countries who still have a monarchy. Uh, for instance, like, like in England. Uh, they have Queen Elizabeth, and they high, uh, most of them uh, uh, hold her in high esteem. Boy, when she's come out or something, uh, they, they come in huge amounts of droves and everything to see her. Uh, it's a great privilege to them. It's a great joy to them. They, they think this is just, this is it. This is, we get to see the queen. Imagine, she's just a woman, uh, a, a, a nice woman. Uh, she's done a lot of good things. Uh, we can appreciate what she's done for her country, but she's just a person. We have the privilege of coming into the very presence and fellowshipping with God himself. Third of all, we have a direct way of access to God in prayer and is granted through Christ, who is our mediator. That is our goal between the one that we go from him to God. Uh, in 1 Timothy, Paul wrote this, For there is one and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself 
a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The Lord says here, the word of God says here, we have one mediator. You can't, a pastor is not a mediator, a priest is not a mediator. Some quote unquote saint that the church has declared is not a mediator. The church itself is not the mediator. We have one mediator and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary is not a mediator. Now some will say, well, no, no, Mary <clears throat> is a mediator between us and Christ and then Christ is a mediator between him and God. No, that's not what the Bible is saying. It is saying there is only one. There is nobody between us and Christ. We are one with him and he is our mediator to the Father. We go through the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing. When, when you go to pray, you, you know that you have direct access to God. I remember growing up and, and you know, to confess my sins, I had to wait until Saturday. Uh, that's the way it was, uh, Friday or Saturday, you know, and then you, you went to confession. And as I got older and I began to think about these things, I said, why can't I not go to God? Why can't I just talk to the Lord? When I've sinned, why can't I talk to him? Oh, there's a barrier there. There was a wall there. I was told, no, I can't do that. I have to go through the priest. And the priest then granted me uh, absolution. He has no power to grant that. No one does. Only God has that. Isn't it wonderful that when you sin, you don't have to wait and say, oh God, uh, I, I hope I get to talk to you sometime through this. Uh, isn't it wonderful that whatever your needs are, you can pray right away? Uh, what a blessing it's been for us as we, uh, it, it's a sad thing as we've dealt with some issues on our street and people dying and people getting really sick and everything, to be able to just say very clearly to them, we're praying for you. And, and to know that God is hearing those prayers. And then fourth of all, the, the righteous demands of the law are forever ever satisfied, delivering the believer from its bondage. We are sinners in bondage until we come to know Christ as our Savior. We are, have to keep the law, and no one can keep the law. No one's ever done it except Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't excuse us as believers from obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Uh, we're still to, uh, to obey God's commandments. We're still to do that. But if we fail by God's grace, we have forgiveness. As the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Those laws were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Now, why does he say nailing it to the cross? In those days, when you committed a crime and the Romans uh, felt that your crime was so bad that you needed to be crucified, they would either write on a, a piece of parchment or on a board or something, your crime. And then they would nail that or they would hang it around your neck so that whoever walked by would see what your crime was. So that's what the picture here is. Except what the picture is that all of our sins were nailed to the cross. Now I don't know about you, but I don't think a placard would do me good. I don't think it's going to be big enough to nail it to anything. But isn't it a glorious thing that God took all of our sins and he put them on Jesus Christ, and that's the picture. He put them on Christ. When he died, he died for every sin we've ever committed. John says that uh, if we say we have uh, uh, no sin, uh, that the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we have saved and not sinned, uh, we call God a liar and his truth is not in us. And then fifthly, eternal forgiveness for sins is assured. You and I who are saved will never stand before God's judgment because of our sin. Now we will stand before God in, in the judgment seat of Christ, which is what we have done since we've been saved. 
Not our sins. Why not our sins? Because Christ has died for all of those sins. And those sins, as the Bible says, have been put away as far as the east is from the west. They have been buried in the deepest sea. They've been buried. They're behind God's back. In other words, he uses these different phrases to say to us, our sins are gone. Gone, gone, gone. Our sins are gone. We will not stand in a judgment. We will not stand at the great white throne judgment and be judged because of our sins. If we were, what would be the point of Christ dying on the cross? I again was, was taught that uh, Christ's death on the cross was, uh, took away the original sin, and that was it. And then I had to do whatever to atone for it. In fact, eventually I'd have to go to purgatory uh, to atone for my sins. And it could be thousands of years or a million for me. And that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, in Ephesians 1, 7, it says this, in whom we have redemption, that is salvation, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. How rich is his grace? There is no limit to it. And then sixthly, the believer come, becomes the recipient of God's righteousness. Think about that. Our righteousness, God says, is as filthy rags. We should do right, good things and everything, but our righteousness is tainted terribly. But at our conversion, we actually receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is what the Bible would say, imputed to us, all right? We are given that. When we stand in the presence of God, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see us. He doesn't see our sin. He doesn't see our failures. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, For he hath made him to be sin for us, not that he made him a sinner, but that he took our sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And seventh, the anticipation of hope of heaven becomes a reality. You ever said to somebody, and this is a question you can ask somebody, you say to them, if you die tonight, what would happen to you? And a lot of people would say, I hope I will go to heaven. I said that when I was asked that question. I hope I'll go to heaven. But that's an empty hope. Unless we are saved, that hope means nothing. That, that's a hope in, in, uh, in a fantasy. When the Lord Jesus Christ was on the cross, there were also two others crucified alongside him, one on either side. They were thieves. Uh, they were, in, according to Roman law, they were to be crucified as well. They were guilty of their crimes. And the idea, I think, when we read this pass those passages is that they hadn't just stole one thing. They, they apparently were professionals at this. Uh, and, and they were stealing and, and robbing and, and maybe, maybe even killing. We don't know. And do you remember there was that one thief? He railed against Christ and then as he began to watch the Lord, as he began to listen to him, as, he, as he's there in his presence, he realized something was totally different. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's an incredible incredible statement when you think about that. He calls him Lord, Master, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now Pilate, uh, when he questioned Jesus Christ and he was talking to him and, and he says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, that's what I came for. He recognized that he, Pilate, even that he must have had some kingdom. Most of the Jews couldn't even understand that. And here this thief on the cross 
God's Holy Spirit spoke to his heart. He said that when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said unto him, and he says the same thing to you and I. Verily I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. And paradise was one of the words that was used for heaven. How marvelous are these provisions that we have in Christ. The things which are now required are, are reported unto you. The things, these things, they're ours if we have received Christ as our Lord and Savior. If, we ha if you have not come to him for salvation, turn to him now. He invites you. He says, come unto me. And remember, this is not an invitation to a funeral. This is an invitation to a wedding. The Bible says that we will be united with him. Someday we will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's taken us as, uh, he's, as a, his bride. He calls us unto him. The Lord then will fill our hearts with overflowing, with joy and peace, with love through believing until we meet him face to to face. I enjoy you to come and enjoy the blessed provision that he has made. Now, last of all, Peter tells us something else. And I think this is so interesting because look at the latter part of the verse. Which things the angels desire to look into? The same things that we've just looked at, these provisions, the angels wanted to look in as well. I don't know if you realize this, but our salvation is as much a mystery to the angels as their ministry is to us. Uh, we often wonder, what, what do the angels do? We have some little glimpses in the scriptures, but we don't know all that they do. Uh, there is obviously uh, evidence in the scriptures that they're watching over each one of us. Uh, some people believe that every one of us have at least uh, what we would call a guardian angel. And uh, some people have two and three. Uh, but uh, he says here that the angels want to know. They want to understand. And notice here, the angels desire. That's a very strong word. It means an unfulfilled desire or overpowering impulse. The, the angels have this consuming desire to understand. Now, I want you to think for a moment. Here, we don't know when the angels were created. We know that Jesus existed forever. And at some point, the angels were created by God. But from that moment on, They've been in the presence of Christ. They've been worshiping him. They've been glorifying him. They've been doing all these things that they do. And one day, he leaves heaven. He lays aside his glory. Just picture him this way if you can. He's the king. And one day, he takes the crown off and lays it aside. He takes the robe of a king off and lays it aside. He gets up from the throne and pushes it away. He not only comes here to earth as a human being, but he comes as a baby. He comes and, and he is born not in a palace, not even in a home, He's born in a manger, possibly in a little cave where there's, there's straw and there's animals. Those of you who have been on farms, you know what that smells like. I was walking by one of my neighbors on another street, and I went like, well, they're starting a barnyard in there. I know they have chickens. Not sure what else is going on in there. 
But imagine that. That's what he comes down and he there is he's born. And imagine the angels are watching this. And they're going like, what is he doing? And then they watch him in his life. And eventually they watch him and they keep on saying, you know, Jesus, I, I, I'm imagining now. This is sanctified imagination, all right? <laughs> I'm imagining them as Jesus is, is going to, uh, before Caiaphas and Annas and all of them and Pilate and, and Herod. And I can imagine him and he doesn't say anything. And they keep on wanting to say, Jesus, call for us. We're, we're waiting. There's 10,000 of us here that are just waiting to rescue you. Don't go through this. And Jesus says not a word. And he says, why? The question is, why? And they see him go to the cross. And even on the cross, he could have called out, 10,000 angels, but he doesn't. Why? Now it lo says here the angel desired to look into. That word look means to stretch forward your head or your head or to bend down. It's the same word that is used when John and Peter went to the tomb. And the stone is rolled away. And in those tombs, the, the opening was very low. It wasn't high. It wasn't a normal walking through a, a six or seven high, foot high doorway. They were very low. You had to stoop down and look. And God is saying that the angels stoop down to look. I think the picture is they're, they're looking down from heaven and they're looking, stooping down, looking as close as they possibly can. The angels wondered what it was like to experience also the grace and the glory of salvation and for God's forgiveness for sins. In fact, Peter says here, in the, in the Greek, it actually says that they are continuously doing that. They're still doing it right now. I believe they're watching us. And they're watching. How do we respond to the salvation that we have? Now, why would the angels be interested in our salvation? Well, first of all, the holy angels have no need of salvation. And the unholy angels cannot be saved. The holy angels do not need salvation, and the unholy one cannot be saved. Second of all, the holy angels announced the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. They ministered him uh, after his time of temptation. They announced his resurrection and his ascension. <clears throat> and now they're doing his bidding in heaven and on earth. They have a ministry still, and they're doing it for him, and they, they, they want to understand all of this that he has done. Third of all, angels exist to glorify God. Everywhere you see them in the scriptures, that's what they're doing. They're glorifying God. And if you remember the, the, the picture that Isaiah has of, of, of the throne of God and the cherubim and, and, the, and the seraphim as, they, as they're around the throne of God, and all, they're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. They spend eternity glorifying God. And it is their desire to glorify him even more. And so their interest in salvation isn't just curiosity. Don't ever get the idea, well, they're just kind of, looking along and saying, well, what, are you, what you guys are doing down there? No, 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 no. They have a purpose in it. Luke tells us that Jesus said, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, we know that there's no one like that. But think about that. When you got saved, in heaven, 
the angels were rejoicing. You ever thought about that? You were excited. You rejoiced, but so were they. One of the reasons we know they're watching is what? Because whenever somebody gets saved, they see it and they rejoice in it. They're rejoicing. Wow, what a chorus that must be. Imagine during some great revival, people getting saved. It must be something else. The angels in heaven rejoice. They praise God every time somebody is saved. Paul said, God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. In other words, we're a spectacle not just to the world, but to the angels as well. The angels watched Paul and others as they got saved and as they began to go out and preach, and they watched them, and they, and they wondered at it, and they were marveled at it. It was a great joy. And the more they saw, the more they glorified God. And by the way, God's grace is also demonstrated in the church. When Paul was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 3, he said this, Manifold wisdom of God is now made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. He wasn't talking about the legislature. He was talking about in heaven. Take your Bibles and turn not too far from where we are to the end. Go to Revelation chapter 5, if you will. Revelation chapter 5. When you get there, let's go down to verse 8. Now, if you remember, John is there, and there is this book, and it's got seals on it, and he's wondering who can open this book. When he had taken the book, is the Lord, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. The Lamb took the book, the Lord Jesus Christ, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints." And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the, thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. I want to stop for a moment. And you've heard me say this before. There are churches who are taking the blood out. There are churches who have taken the blood out of their songs in their songbooks. I find it interesting that when God writes the song, what does he talk about? The blood of Jesus Christ. Listen to that again. He says there, they sang a new song. This is a new song. Thou art worthy, Here, this is the beginning of the song, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood, Thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made unto us God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. And behold, I have heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands, and thousands, and thousands. They didn't have the word million. They didn't have the word billion. They didn't have the word trillion. How can we imagine trillion? They didn't have it, but this is the only way they could express it. We don't know how many there are, but it's huge. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That's what the angels are saying. A few people don't believe they sing, but I think they sing. 
Aren't you just waiting to hear that chorus? What a choir that must be. Now, they're not the recipients of salvation. And yet they join in singing of the redemption song. They observe, they understand, and in, they glorify God. So Peter tells us the angels of heaven look down at us. They are amazed, they're filled with the desire to understand all that God in Christ, all that Christ has done dying for our sins being raised again for our justification, and the Spirit of God wooing and convicting the human heart. They love to see that. They want to see that. They are looking to that. And they're filled with wonder and amazement at all they see. The Bible tells us there is joy in the presence of the angel of God when one sinner repents and is saved. They look down. They're overwhelmed by the grace they see that is flowing from the, the wounds of the Lord Jesus Christ. The salvation that pours forth from his heart. The blessedness of his cross and the, the winning of souls. What a blessing! What a glory! What a wonderment! And it's all for our taking. It's all for us. And by the way, when we think of Peter and why he's writing to them, because they're going to go through persecution, they're going to go through difficult times, these things that he says here are an encouragement to them. And so for us, no matter how difficult life's trials are, we can face them with triumphant because of the greatness of God's grace in giving us salvation that the prophets had studied, that the Holy Spirit inspired, that the apostles preached, and that the angels continually investigate. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for these things these few of many, many things that you have provided for us, these incredible provisions. We praise you and thank you, our Heavenly Father, that in Christ we can have our sins forgiven and we can have eternal life and we can have fellowship with thee and we can have our, our prayers answered and we can know that we receive the righteousness of Christ and that we are no longer uh, subject to the law, and that we have forgiveness of sins and cleansing. And we have a true hope of eternal life in heaven itself. And we thank you, Lord, that this is so great, so marvelous, so wonderful, that the angels themselves bend down low and continually look to see and understand. O oh, Heavenly Father, if it is so precious to them, how precious it must be to us. And Lord, for one who is listening, watching, and doesn't know Christ as their Savior, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to their hearts. Open those hearts. Show them that they're sinners, sinners that need to be saved, sinners that need to come to Jesus for salvation. He is the only one. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Draw them to thee, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If, my friend, you're watching and you do not know Christ as your Savior, uh, if you would go to our website, uh, you will find there the plan of salvation. You will find how you can come to know Christ as your Savior, and we'll be praying for you. Uh, Lord bless you.